very warm welcome once again to the e banking summit uh, thank you very much for joining us and since it's the banking and economy summit uh, we are now getting straight up into the macro picture because it's the macro that really impacts uh, everything and we had a fantastic opening session uh, that you just heard right now uh, three of india's best economists all of them very visible uh, their articles and their television appearances are something that you must have seen and we are doing this just uh, a couple of weeks uh, ahead of the next union budget and it's the new year therefore i'm going to start uh, by asking this panel starting with you madan to quickly describe the state of the indian economy uh, as we are in the year 2023 Yeah, it's good. Go ahead, go ahead. It's good. Yeah, thanks, Sadar, and for having me out here. And good morning to everyone. Uh, today, when I look at the Indian economy, I would say that uh, we are in a very stable state. Now, stability is something which is very important in today's world because there is gloom and doom when we are talking of the world economy. And we ourselves have come out of uh, the COVID times when we had a lockdown, which affected our economy quite uh, badly. I would say. and now that we have come back to a steady state growth of around 7% and even when i'm looking at say 23 24 while the estimates are definitely lower than 7% we are looking at something like 66 and a half percent for 20, 23 24 it still does stand out in this in 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 the in the global economy so i think that's one of the reasons why i think we can be uh, fairly happy about it but this said i think there are a number of pending issues which have need to be addressed and um, probably we can talk about that a little yeah. later but i would say that on the whole i think the indian economy is doing fairly satisfactorily and uh, while there are lots of concern points i'm sure the government and the rbi are also aware of it and they will be addressed in course of time but i would think that uh, it will probably take another 2 or 3 years before we get to that path of 7 to 8% growth which is something which had uh, characterized the indian growth path in the decade of 2010 to maybe around 2017 18 uh so the key message from madan uh, 2023 6 six and a half uh, even closer to 7 by the most optimistic estimates but returning to a high growth pass closer to 8% another 3 mr joshi your opening comments well i kind of agree with uh, what madan just said but i think the uh, uh, one of the reasons for this spurt in growth that we are seeing is uh, that covid is not causing any functional disruption so the segments of the economy which were languishing like the services uh, the contact intensive they are showing a very strong growth i think that's one of the factors the other i think is we are also seeing some rebalancing of growth towards private consumption and investment so that is also a positive sign uh, i think apart from that i think economy also enjoys some structural strengths which will help it and which are helping it and one of them is the health of the corporate sector as per crisel ratings there are five upgrades to one downgrade so i think and the leverage levels are extremely low at least in the crisel portfolio so that actually allows the corporates to withstand another shock and at the same time it also allows them to re-leverage and invest i think as and when the opportunity arises so i think that's one positive and the second is i think this is about the banking uh, conclave but i think the banking sector is in a much better position to lubricate the economy today than it was uh, uh, earlier so so i think you have few boxes that are getting ticked and i think this is going to help the economy i think withstand the next year which is going to be a little uh, troublesome 23 24 and also i think it's going to uh, help you sustain higher growth over the medium run okay so a consensus of sorts uh, uh, higher growth in the medium term shogoto uh, i i heard yesterday uh, that one of india's largest banks is now reaching out to large corporate borrowers and saying uh, do you need some credit uh, now this is just a one off anecdotally but i'm sure a lot of that is happening uh, but are we setting the stage for another uh, boom to bust cycle in 3 to 4 years i'm just adding that to the original question of the state of india's economy yeah uh, so thanks to that uh, so one thing is uh, what is remarkable i find is that after 3 years larger than that more than 3 years a continuous series of shocks 
the kind of resilience that we are seeing in the economy, it doesn't matter whether we are going at 6%, 7%, etc. The kind of resilience that we are seeing, we are talking about the banking sector. Uh, RBI's recent financial stability report came, came out with uh, very, very manageable uh, stress levels in the banking sector. MSMEs, there is no stress whatsoever in this segment where we had initially thought there would be an emerging stress. In fact, the going is so good that I'm now worried. I mean, what are we missing? Are we, are we missing something? Because the, the thing is completely on the right. I mean, you know, I mean, everything good, looks good. Of course, there are big risks that will come in from the external sector because the external sector is likely to slow down. And um, we are already seeing in the global economy, I mean, the credit markets, the high, high yield credit markets, that's beginning to compress. So we are going to see some volatility. But are we missing out some risks is what is my worry. And, and, and to look ahead a little bit, what are the things? It's not a matter of growing at 6% or 7%. What are the things that we need to do to be able to sustain a 6.5-7% growth? Over a quick quick follow-up, if you could just sort of tabulate the top three risks, bullet points. <laughs> so, I mean, the risks are external. I mean, there, there is absolutely. Uh, so, in, in, in terms of a massive shock, uh, so that, that's external. I mean, uh, coming in from a global sort of... Look, uh, in the last three years, we have had three major channels of this of transmission from the global spillovers, the central bank rates, etc. One was the capital markets. We have the portfolio out outflows, etc. We are mostly more or less done with that. The second is the commodities, commodity shock that, that, that we encountered, energy, metals, food, etc. Even that seems to have tapered off uh, to a very significant extent. The third one now, which is not an immediate problem, but it's likely to be simmering over a period of time, is this global slowdown where the developed markets are likely to go into a recession, exports, which okay. has been a big driver. Well, I think, yeah, so you are in an environment, I think in 2022, we saw uh, interest rate rise, but the real interest rates were still negative. Now, in 23, you are going to see real interest rates become positive. So it's the financial conditions are going to tighten, as they say. So it's Quick follow-up on that for yeah. the wider audience. When you say interest uh, rates, uh, will our fixed deposits give us a real positive returns in 2023? Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. to what extent? I think that depends on how much the banks pass it on. How could, and I think given, the, as the previous speaker pointed out, that there is pressure to raise deposits, I would expect the, the fixed deposit rates to keep rising until the time, I think. Of, uh, that, that's a general, general comment. But I think just to add to the, to the risk part, I wanted to highlight that in a rising interest rate scenario, if the leverage is very high, I'm talking of global debt to GDP ratio, which is almost 350% of, uh, of, of GDP, I think the cost uh, of servicing the debt and the risks, I think, to some of the entities which are not used to higher cost of capital, I think is always there. So one has to keep wa watching out for what kind of risk can emanate when I think the financial conditions globally tighten. There is a slowing growth. Your ability to service the debt is reducing. So there is, I think, there is some, uh, that's also flashing, if not red, at least right. yellow right now. Uh, mother. Yes, Siddharth, I think there's one thing we should keep in mind. See, today when we're talking of the Indian economy doing better than the world economy, it's a statistic which I'm talking of. Okay, so it's about six and a half, seven percent. Now, as bankers, I think one needs to be very careful because normally what we have seen in the past, we just go back historically, say the last two decades. There are certain business phases when the economy is doing very well. Bankers tend to be over-optimistic. So that's when you get very aggressive in terms of pushing the lending portfolio. The economy seems to be doing well. Investment is picking up. So therefore, you say, let me start lending. And you also have an invest rate environment, which is uh, uh, feasible or rather it's something which is acceptable for the borrowers. So therefore, people start borrowing. And that's Are when you run into a problem. Likely to happen? No, I'm just saying that uh, at today, we should not get carried away by the 6, 7. We should not. I just have to be a bit careful that uh, in case... Uh, in, 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 They do such a thing, we should not run the risk of uh, running. Just for example, we're talking about the retail segment. Normally, the retail segment has a lower probability of default. That is an accepted thing. But this whole push for the retail should be followed with sound credit judgment when you're lending. So a case of saying that, look, I want to race ahead in the market. Everybody is there. I want to go ahead of the others. One should not compromise risk. Uh, since this is a kind of a new year assessment of what is likely uh, happening, the point that was made earlier, how, uh, how would you describe the cleanup of corporate India's balance sheet and consequently the banking sector in, in, in the most sort of uh, common sense uh, ways that you can describe? 
No, in fact, I think the cleaning up of the balance sheets of banks has almost been done. And that is what gets reflected when you look at the NPA numbers of the public sector banks in particular, which bore the brunt of the crisis which we had earlier, and also in terms of the financial stability report of the RBI. So I think that particular part is all right. The only question is that we should not be repeating such kind of mistakes. What does, what does this cleanup mean for the arm admin? The cleaning up basically means that if banks have been able to make the provisions, they're able to do the write-offs, what was required in terms of the NPAs which are there. Now we say that the situation is stable. Banks should not be having this fear or any kind of an apprehension when it comes to lending. Now we had this situation when we had this uh, uh, NPA issue which came up where banks preferred not to lend to the corporates. And he said, I'd rather go in and lend for the retail sector where the probability of default is actually lower. So I think this kind of an apprehension is behind us. Shogatu, taking this point forward, I want to ask you, uh, as the arm admi here, uh, if, if the balance sheets have been cleaned up, if uh, the NPA problem has been sorted out, why is my EMI not reducing? Why, why, am I, why is my cost of capital becoming higher? I, as a retail borrower, uh, uh, I, have, I have done my best to continue service the loan even during COVID times. Why am I not getting anything? There are no tax breaks from the Sarkar. The banking system is not giving us any leeway. Jayan to Jayan kaha? So, uh, two things. One, uh, from what Madan is saying, how does the Ahmadmi benefit uh, from the cleanup of the balance sheets, banking balance sheets? One, is your provisioning costs go down? Yeah. So, I mean, that automatically, the provisioning cost is typically loaded onto the interest rates, right? The second question that you asked, that why are we not seeing uh, a, a reduction? I mean, this is a rate cycle which has been so sharp. I mean, you, you haven't seen this kind of a rate cycle increase. And together with this now, uh, what you, you heard Amitabh saying this uh, with deposits, liquidity, system liquidity used to be surplus of 6, 7 lakh crores, not even a year back. Yeah, That has now shrunk to zero. So obviously that will show up in something, right? I mean, you know, uh, from, the, from the point of a monetary policy tightening is to raise rates. And that will show up in, 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 in your, for the arm be in the product. Fortunately, I think we are more or less done with the rate, type, rate tightening cycle. So, I mean, slowly now, and I, and I think at some point in time, you will get liquidity back into the system. The reason that I say this is that, that global spillovers that we were talking about, I mean, the rupee, uh, the rupee had, had weakened very sharply, and which, which was forcing the RBI to, to intervene very, very sharply. And one of the key defenses in a rupee is this liquidity tightening. So I think now we are past that stage, the rupee, we, we do not expect, of course, I mean, I'm not going to forecast the currency because that, that's a mugs game. I mean, you know, so, but hopefully we will be starting to see uh, a, 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 an easing. If, I'm not saying a rate cuts, etc., but we, we will not see this kind of tightening that we have seen in the last six months. Mr. Joshi, uh, let's take up that point. The story of last year has been inflation, not just in India, but globally. And it's uh, been repeated, and I will repeat it once again for the audience and all our viewers who are watching us across our platforms on Business Today or with our media partners, Daily Hunt and others. Uh, America has in witnessed inflation which generations have not seen. India is used to inflation, and the Aam Admi uh, is used to higher inflation than the privileged classes because inflation is ultimately a tax on the poor. What is happening to inflation? Because all the latest numbers also seem to suggest that perhaps the worst is behind us. Do you agree? Well, I think uh, the inflation did come down. Uh, and in the last two months, which is uh, November and December, we have seen it below 6%. But I think it, I would say that I would only give one cheer to that, okay. uh, not three cheers. And the reason is uh, uh, the if you take the vegetable inflation out, vegetables is the most uh, volatile component of inflation. It keeps moving up and down. This entire decline is due to vegetable prices, vegetable inflation. If you take vegetables out, inflation is actually at 7.2%. And, and uh, just to add uh, and contextualize it for what, what Mr. Joshi is saying is that the RBI sees through this data, sabzi ke bhao, uh, it doesn't account into, that means that your EMIs are not going to go down. Maybe the cost of capital may go up further. Am I right in describing it that way? You are the teacher here. <laughs> well, no, I, I think the RBI will look at, I think last in the last policy, they focused on the core inflation, which is taking the food and fuel out. And so I think core inflation actually went up yesterday. But, but Sorry, I'm contesting this point with you. In, uh, fuel inflation is being controlled by the government artificially. 
it's being suppressed. The budgetary allowance has been made for the oil marketing companies. Food inflation shouldn't bother us that much because you are giving a massive food safety net to hundreds of millions of people. So why is the RBI raising interest rates? Well, I think because the, the core inflation part, which is linked to demand, is still high. Actually, U.S. inflation, overall U.S. inflation rate is higher than India. But their core inflation is lower than India. Madan, this is something I've discussed with you like maybe for 10 years. And my point here for the entire office, we'll also have the RBI governor later today and hopefully he'll answer this question. Are we just looking at top level cost of capital, ignoring the reality of a complex economy like India and making money expensive for everyone, Amadmi and the big borrower? See, I think so that, uh, let's look at it this way. The way in which monetary policy has been designed, you are supposed to target headline inflation. So no way does the mandate say that you'll have to look at core inflation, vegetable inflation, so on and so forth. Why is the RBI so doing therefore, it? No, therefore, as long as we are in this range of 6%, there is a certain kind of a stance which you have to take. It's not to say that in case inflation comes down to say 2%, the RBI is going to bring inflation to 0%. Sir, but so many economists and commentators have castigated the RBI, the governor, for being a little... Uh, sort of relaxed on this, saying, no, no, at 4%, you should have hit the no, actually, no, red light no, and think, breaks. And I think the RBI said very clearly when they kept interest rates low, that their priority was growth after after we had a lockdown. So they said, we'll do everything to protect the economy. So everybody knew of the trade-off. You only felt that as long as growth was in jeopardy, you sort of kept interest rates low. The moment you realize that growth seemed to be sort of steadier, and today when we take pride in saying India is the fastest growing economy, so obviously growth is better, but inflation continues to be nagging and going up. So therefore, that's the RBI has taken a So if you were the RBI rates. governor, what and would you do in the next policy? Meeting? See, in the next policy, I think we still need to increase interest rates, because I think, Siddharth, you're always looking at EMI, you're not looking at a saver. Hmm. Just remember, Siddharth, if you have taken a loan, you're also putting money in a deposit. Yeah. Yeah. You're, getting a, you're getting a better rate out there. So I think when the RBI is there, you need to balance both the savings as well as the lending rate. And I think the RBI is also talking in terms of having a positive real interest rate. So today, when I have inflation at 6% and the repo rate at, say, 6.25%, I still have a, a nominal, a real ret a return of around 0.25%. So, so, Swagato, should I be uh, uh, console myself in the evening with a point, <laughs> you know, 25 basis point uh, real rate, <laughs> interest rate and say, okay. Siddharth, let me ask the audience. Uh, the mic. Uh, 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 home loan rates have gone up uh, because home loans are now uh, external benchmark link, repo rate link. So they have gone up by 200 basis points, right? I mean, they have. Kitne jan aap me se, I mean, many of you will have home loans. Kisko effect hua hai ye home loans ke, ke EMIs mein? How much, how, how one many... One hand went up, one hand went ah, up. How many of the, you are... Oh, no, 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 wait, wait, you, are, you started something very nice. Uh, just to add in my voice, have your EMIs gone up? Have... No, 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 just look that. I mean, Baba, EMIs look at that, gone. look at that. EMIs will definitely have gone up. But how many of you ask people, everybody out here, you have a bank deposit, have your deposit rates gone up? Have you benefited? Everybody okay, one person is saying no. No, no. Repeat that question, seriously. Repeat. I think every bank has increased their deposit rates. So I think if you're saying that you have not, your deposit rate hasn't gone up, you've probably matched, gone in for a wrong tenure. Yeah? The, the, the deposit rates have gone up across the board. This, this is the basic problem. This problem that this the rate increases have not hit any of us materially enough. Sir, just to add to that, if 200 basis points of rate increase have not hit us materially, has 200 basis points of rate increase led to a material decline in inflation? We just heard from Mr. Joshi. I would argue that that has not impacted uh, the... So that is the problem now. So monetary policy, if we assume, if we take for granted that that 4% inflation is sacrosanct, I'm, I have my doubts. Why should it be? Why should, yeah, yeah, why, it, why be? should it be? Why that, should it be? So, so that we will, we will appoint a new committee with Madan as the chairperson. What would you say? No, I, I'm so being with, serious. To, to, to what would you say? I mean, there are very few people, and I'm very proud to say that uh, economists are, you know, not very flashy people. But these three people, and I followed their work for 20 years, are the finest amongst the finest in the country. What would you do when yeah, it comes I'm, to I'm setting the? To, I'm not going to say that with those cameras being trained <laughs> because that that, that, that have No, what would it be? Five percent, six. My guess is because this. 4% thing, it came out because it's RBI... It's a millstone around huh, so my, 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 my guess is we should be okay with 5. I mean, a fast-growing economy. This, These numbers, the 3.3% fiscal fiscal uh, level, etc. are meant for it. Sir, Bharat Atman Nirbhar hai for everything else except monetary policy, which is the where the basic tenets have been fixed in I the mean, US and you just copy-paste it on India. The I, think you're, I think you're Siddharth, if you looked at it, when 
the MPCA targeted 4% inflation. And one just looked at the previous 10 years. What was the inflation rate in India, the CPI inflation rate number at that point in time? In 8 out of 10 years, we were above 5 models which showed that 4% is the ideal rate. And fortuitously, fortuitous, it was an academy, that's what I would tend to believe. But fortuitously, after we declared 4%, we actually had inflation in region of 4%. But not because of monetary policy commitment. Not because of monetary policy commitment. You see the way in which uh, inflation is uh, determined, food prices don't move up or down because of RBA policy. Yeah. Okay, I would say that my Saturday, policy, Monday, uh, subsidy prices, they don't even know yeah. RBI exists, perhaps. And and today, if you look at the core inflation, see the commentaries of all the corporates, second quarter results, they're saying high input costs, we are in the process of passing on the costs, which means even tomorrow, if inflation comes to 2%, 2%, percent, two percent, I mean, RBI okay. lowers the interest no, no, rate, but inflation has gone, gone up, costs have gone up, this uh, and and not uh, Atman Nirbhar for Savers Bharat, it only benefits corporates. Corporates, large organized entities are able to play the money cycle, the capex cycle and the interest rate cycle. The arm army gets it. Siddharth, what do you mean by corporates? Corporates to paisa rakhte nahi hai, apne shareholders, hum log dete hai, apne hum log ko paisa mil jata hai, shareholders ko milta hai, uh, dividends milta hai. Huh? So, I mean, whether corporates benefit, I, I, I completely agree. But the no, actual uh, explain this point because this end, is what we are asked. At the end of the day, it is we who benefit. And remember, this is what I'm trying to emphasize again and again. This is the problem. This is a huge problem for our country. People like us in this room, with this income demographics of this room, will have no effect whatsoever of this cost increases. While as the, the other, the, step outside this hotel, if you see the people there, they are impacted massively. Massively. Huh? The surprise that I saw in this was that I would have thought that the smallest, the micro and small businesses would have been hit seriously. That is what is surprising. I'm not surprised about this income demographics and, the, and the, uh, all across the country. It's absolutely not. not Mr. Impact. Joshi, you wanted to come in. No, I think, uh, so I, I agree with you that I think statistically the poor faces uh, a higher burden of inflation because they have a larger part uh, of food larger part of fuel, and these had been uh, uh, punishingly high, so to say. I think there was some cushion from the government via the, the food subsidy. I think that kept, uh, uh, kept things under control. But I think the, the India's uh, uh, consumption basket is such that we have higher weight for food, I mean, so unlike US and other countries. So the core is a, core is a small part. That's why I think it was decided that we focus on the aggregate inflation. But uh, I think the point I wanted to make was that uh, when rates rise, I think some gain, some lose. And when rates fall, it's the same thing. I mean, people were, I right. mean, you were getting 5% for one year fixed deposit until last year which is lower than the inflation rate, you are losing money. So now you will gain money. So it's not, it's not that it is a uniformly bad for everyone, but low and stable inflation is good for everyone in the long run. That is a Absolutely, and no one can argue against that macroeconomic fundamental tenet. Uh, the idea was just to provoke a debate on this, and since we have moved into the stage where we are now talking about subsidies, uh, whether they are institutionalized in the form of food security or uh, the sort of ad hoc uh, a subsidy that we have seen when it comes to fuel prices. I want to turn this debate to one of the other bigger macroeconomic concerns and challenges, which I call OPS versus BJP. Now, for some of you who might wonder which OPS I'm talking about, I'm not talking about um, the South Indian politician. I'm talking about the old pension scheme versus the BJP. And those of who you follow politics here would have realized that that has had a political impact also, perhaps to some extent in the state of Himachal Pradesh as well. This is a panel of economists, I'm not discussing politics, but this is a question I want to pose to you, Madan, and I'll go across the panel once again on this. How significant is OPS versus BJP as a macroeconomic and fiscal concern in this year? And remember, this is a year which is the uh, pre-general election 2024 year. 
See, the, I'll uh, talk on it at a broader sense because I'm keeping the politics of it out. I think there are certain commitments which every government has, has made already in the form of, say, interest payments, in the form of subsidies, in the form of pensions. And I think we should take it for granted that that's a part of the expenditure which is committed. So whenever we talk in terms of budgeting, we'll have to talk of whatever remains from it, how best can we work with that. So rather than getting into a specific thing like saying that should we have food subsidy, should we have the OPS, I think these are more of political issues which will be sorted out. And I think whenever we look at economics, we normally tend to look out on the economics. I think political economy is very important while running the government. Because none of us have skin in the game. Today we finish this lecture, we go out, and then we carry on with our lives. But I think political economy actually plays a major role in all economic decisions. Because when you come to power, there are certain promises made, there are certain expectations which are there. And I think it's rightful that that you follow policies on that line. So when we look at the budget, I think rather than looking at these things, we have to say, overall, are we fiscally managing the budget well? Are we making the money work to the extent that we are able to do? So I think that's how I would look at the budget. So that's why I think as economists, we focus a lot on the capex part, saying that is the government doing well? Okay, there will be certain things like you may say that food subsidy is not good. I may say that fertilizer subsidy is not good. But at the end of the day, I think it's the responsibility of the government to ensure that the, the, the lower section, the lower income levels of people are actually their requirements are there. And also since we are talking of inflation, I think if you do not give all these kind of subsidies, you do not give this kind of pensions, you do not give this kind of income, the overall consumption cycle also gets affected and inflation would be high. Absolutely. Mr. Joshi, uh, coming back to this point, because the old pension scheme has been described uh, by various economists, including Montek Singh Aluwalia, as fiscally disastrous. And uh, just to re-emphasize this, the old pension scheme matter is not just a union budgetary matter. It is uh, related to every single state and union territory's budget. And as we know, the state deficits are also a matter of concern, not just the central fiscal deficit. Your thoughts on this subject? Well, I think the, the OPS is unfunded pension. So I think it, it is a pressure point and I think there's enough evidence globally that unfunded pension schemes lead to extreme fiscal stress at some point in time. So I think it is good that we get out, get that out of the way and I think the, 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 the new pension scheme which is, is much better because at least there is funding for it. So it's like postponing the disaster, I mean, so if you, you may, it may sound good to the ears, good, maybe good for the people, uh, OPS, but I think from a fiscal uh, rectitude point of view, it is, it is an extreme stress which will show up later. Uh uh, there are already three states, uh, Shogoto, uh, who are uh, well down this new path or a return to the past and this is not a past that we should uh, feel happy about. It's not a glory uh, a period at all. Uh, what are your thoughts, especially because uh, in, in election year or pre-election year, do you think populism will weigh on the macroeconomic uh, balance sheet? So, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, to be completely blunt, I mean, the OPS is a, this will be a disaster. It's a fiscal time bomb that is sticking throughout the world, this is, this is as, you, as you pointed out. You, you, you've heard of President Macron trying to uh, reform the French uh, pension system. This is, I mean, absolutely there is no way to, and, and the problem with the OPS is it is benefiting a bunch of people that are already at the, at the very top. Yeah. I mean, so, so remember that. That's not the problem in, in terms of subsidies. Uh, so, look at the center's budget. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, uh, center's budget, huh? 41% goes to states uh, by, by the Fiscal uh, Finance Commission rules. So, of the remaining, uh, of the remaining, about 40%, 42% is payments for interest. Then there are the committed expenditures, the salaries, wages, pensions, etc. That's another 20%. Then there are these quasi-committed, all the subsidies. Uh, quasi-committed meaning not completely, but I mean you can't get, get beyond. After paying all of this, you do not have more than 10 to 15% of your receipts for any development expenditure. Forget the capex factors, the bully jai here. Even for your development expenditures, you only have 10%. Is this sustainable? It's not. So now, I think to the credit of this government, I think they are shifting uh, the, the many of these liabilities to a more contingent liability, what we economists call contingent, the insurance-based programs. Something like the ECLGS program or the, or the health insurance, the medical insurance, etc. I think that's the way to go. 
to minimize costs, not have a straight uh, outlay on, on, on to this, but make it a con contingent thing so that you provide a social safety net. And, and people in India, for a poor country like India, you do need a social safety net. But that's the way to go about it. Okay. Sagat, I just have one uh, point on this. That I think the role of the state is to be a welfare state because you're looking at redistribution. So I agree, OPS and all that, one may have different views on it. I'm not getting into that particular issue. But I think, unfortunately, what's happened is that today we think that the budget should be stimulating the economy. Unfortunately, I think the, the economy runs primarily because of the private sector. Government is only supposed to provide some kind of a supplement in the form of whatever it can do. So I think the objective, is, the way I look at it is that the objective of the government, the basic goal should be to make sure that the redistribution part takes place. And... Is, is, and uh, you have policies okay, that they continue. Sorry for interrupting you. Uh, I, uh, is OPS redistribution or is it like uh, making no, the fat cat fatter? No, here we are talking in terms of, I mean, the quality of the pension. I'm not getting into that issue. I'm saying, I'm just saying there's a certain amount of pension. They can sort it out, which is the most efficient way of doing it. I'm not getting into that issue. But I'm saying that this issue is saying that it's a time bomb because, uh, let, let me put it this way, very, uh, this thing that we have a PLI scheme. Okay? A PLI is also a subsidy. We don't call it a subsidy. No, it's called an incentive. But isn't it funded partly uh, through uh, export in, uh, no, no, it's not earnings? Being funded. It's not being funded by earnings. The earnings is going to the corporate. Yeah, so but the corporate is also paying tax. So everything is being, no, but even, no, doctor, whether you're paying tax or not, that's a different kind of a structure. Like, for example, if I'm giving free uh, water to the farmers, isn't the farmer producing wheat? Why are we hammering that saying that that's a wrong thing? So I'm saying the whole idea of the budget is that you're providing incentives to various sections of society. So, so you are arguing subsidy, that a uh, return to the old pension scheme is like one more layer of subsidy added. It's another layer of subsidy. As I told you, I don't really understand the old pension scheme, new pension scheme, which is a better, because I have heard arguments on both sides. So therefore, I'm not, I, I don't understand, so I cannot comment on it. But I'm saying that getting into a, into, into single items is a different kind of an issue. But overall, if you look at the ethos of a budget, you're providing incentives to all the sections, which the government is doing, either it's industry, it's farmers, or maybe it's also the retired gentry. Mr. Joshi has been silent on this, and then Shogoto to you, and we'll wrap up with a quick discussion on the budget. Well, I think uh, the way I would look at it is that the role of policy, be it fiscal or any other, I think is to grow the size of the pie. I mean, if you don't have growth, if you don't increase the size of the GDP, what are you going to redistribute? I think, apart, so that is one. So I think you have to have policies which grow the size of the pie. At the same time, I think the protecting the vulnerable section is very critical in this country. Uh, and I think the way it is being done, at least right now, I think you cut the leakages part. I think the digitalization has played a big role. So you will have to, you will have to protect the vulnerable sec sections, whether it is through a safety net job scheme like Narega, or, uh, or I think uh, uh, a free food to certain parts of the population who can't afford. So this redistribution and and growth have to go hand in hand. I think they should not be. Typically, what happens is when you go grow very fast. The, the the inequality rises. I think that's that's known in the world. I mean, the gap between the rich and the poor rises. So in that scenario, the, the role of the government is to ensure that the vulnerable sections are not left out completely. And I this includes the retired people also, who get the pensions, which we are talking well, about. Well, <laughs> okay. <a> <laughs> okay. Uh, Shogodo, you wanted to come in and then we'll... Just, just, just a very brief point. I mean, beach beach may economists have some... Uh, some 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 benefits. I mean, you know, this contrary to uh, what what people think, there are these. Uh, what Madan pointed out. I mean, there are different types of subsidies. Yes, the PLI is also a subsidy. But remember, uh, for the for for capex. I mean, this is where the academics come in. The growth multiplier of a of a capital expenditure is about three. That is to say, one unit of capital subsidy or production leads to over a period of time three units yeah. of growth. For a revenue expenditure, it's less than one. That's the problem. Okay, that's the problem. Uh, we are in the final part of uh, this uh, session and I want to turn the attention to uh, a big macroeconomic event which is coming up, which is on the 1st of February, the union budget. Uh, Modinomics is uh, Business Today's uh, brand name for this budgetary coverage exercise. So I would request all of you who are here and those who want to check us out on our website and all our social platforms to check our coverage through this month and even subsequently. The big numbers, uh, Madan and I'll start with you on this, 6.5 uh, 6, 6 uh, are the two numbers that perhaps uh, we will hear in the budget. 
But the question to you is, how challenging is this budget-making exercise uh, given the overall macroeconomic backdrop, both within India and globally? I would say that uh, the biggest challenge is managing perceptions. Because I think the government has been very, very prudent when it draws up budgets. But the important part is what is it, how is it that we interpret it? So everybody likes to say that, uh, will populism come in? Now, what exactly do we mean by populism? Is PLI populism? Is old pension scheme populism? Is more food subsidy populism? But I think I mean, that can be debated. But the important thing is that what we have seen from the government is they are committed towards moving towards that fiscal path of fiscal deficit of 4.5%. So I'm quite sure when you're talking of 6.5%, they will talk of something like, say, 6, 5.5% for the next year, depending upon what the revised uh, fiscal deficit number looks like for 22, 23. And within that, they will do the best about what can be done in terms of uh, uh, managing the expenses. And we know very well that if the economy is going to slow down, the kind of buoyancy which we saw in tax revenue will not be repeated this year. So I think the GST collections have been uh, too good to be true for, for last year, aided by inflation. So we're saying inflation coming down, real GDP growth slowing down. By tax collections, growth will also not be that buoyant, probably maybe a single digit rate. So I think the government will manage there. But I think the more important challenge for them is how do they manage perceptions? Because they have to give a feeling that they're being prudent, they're being populist, both at the same time, which is going to be difficult. Okay, one would say that uh, when it comes to managing perception, uh, the Modi government and Modi-nomics has done a fairly decent job of that in the past years. We'll uh, see what happens. Uh, Mr. Joshi, on that same question to you. Well, I think the, the you asked about how challenging it is. It is, I mean, every budget is a balancing act. I'm yet to see a budget which is not a balancing act. But this one, I think, will test the dexterity of the policymaker because, one, you are entering into a slower growth phase. Uh, last year, we got 15.4% nominal growth. This year, uh, for 23-24, the expectation is that it's not going to be higher than 11%. So your tax revenues will be constrained next year. So now the issue is you have been pushing CapEx for the last two years very clearly from the budgetary expenditure. How will you maintain that? The only way to maintain that is to restructure the spending part. I think that's where the challenge will come. So cut down on the on the unnecessary spends or I think or trim the subsidy bill. In some cases you can be lucky if global fertilizer prices come down your fertilizer subsidy bill will reduce but my sense is that overall subsidy bill is going to be uh, much lower than what it was last year and that will give them some leverage to uh, to maintain. And, and this is also partly aided by our decision a brave strategic decision to buy Russian oil. Yeah, that helped. That helped. I think so. The, the right now, I think so. Ensuring that you reduce the fiscal deficit, maintain your capex momentum, if not at last year's level, but at least uh, it should be growing faster than the GDP. That's that's my. What point. what unconventional choices would you recommend uh, that are required to be made, given that buying Russian oil when practically the whole Western world was shunning Russian oil? was a very unconventional and a very brave uh, strategic move. It could have had various consequences. Foreign Minister Jayashankar has defended that not once but dozens of times and I think he's pretty much shut up everyone who has been critical of this decision. Are there any unconventional choices that could be made? Well, there are very few. I mean, I, I, I think in 23, you'll get lucky because oil prices will are coming down and they, with the global slowdown, I think the oil prices should soften. They may not soften to the extent that usually prices soften when global growth slows and there is a China factor also because if China recovers faster then it's again going to push the oil prices. So I think uh, we are working with an assumption of $80 a barrel for 23-24 which is lower than what we got in 22-23 so there will be some, some saving on that front. Uh, but I think from uh, there is no quick uh, redressal of this. I mean, we have been trying to, we have been energy dependent, uh, we have been dependent on imports, and I think that is, that story is, is going to play out. I think now the focus is gradually shifting towards, uh, towards how do you address uh, the climate issues, how do you reduce your uh, uh, dependence on fossil fuels. That's not a one year journey, that's a long, long journey, and I think I s expect this budget to announce something on that particularly to help the small uh, and medium enterprises transition towards greener means. I think larger corporates, everybody talked about, they have cash, they can actually accelerate that. So I think some of that will also happen, which is linked to fuel in some sense, but it's a long, long, long-term story. Many more budgets will be... Yes, please. Comes in, please. 
Pardon me. But I think the Amadmi should also know that crude oil price coming down doesn't mean that petrol and diesel become cheaper. That's a brilliant okay, point. Okay, because the taxes are not being cut, states don't cut, the centre is not going to reduce the excise duty in this difficult year. We'll have the same explanation, tough times. So therefore, we'll continue with the same kind of inflation numbers which we have. Uh, I, I, if you've noticed, I haven't even asked the question about whether GST will be expanded to include some of the big ticket items which have been left out. I think I have lost hope. But that's a subject for another panel. Shogodo, I'll let you have the last word on today's uh, panel and setting the backdrop for the budget from your point of view. So, I mean, uh, thank you. So, uh, just keep the mic I'm, closed. I'm, I'm very clear uh, that uh, capex needs to be the focus. I mean, they have they have started the momentum. Uh, this this should be like a complete drumbeat uh, throughout the next two three years. Fortunately, even private the private capex cycles also seems to have revived. Huh? So that needs to be. Meridia uh, asset monetization, that is a very, very important part. So, I mean, they should be looking at asset monetization and on the disinvestment side. So, that's the non-tax receipts. They should actually begin to, at the lower middle levels, they should begin to cut taxes. So, non-tax receipts should be the focus. And for that, uh, you need to have a fairly robust equity market. So all the things that need to be done, no surprises at all of any kind. And we are still very dependent on foreign investment. In, a, in an environment where foreign capital is still more or less shaky, we need to make absolutely sure there are not a single misstep. Uh, so that, that uh, the foreign capital, because global investors now, and, and to this government's credit, I mean, the reason that why we are in a sweet spot now is because of this fiscal prudence that the government has actually displayed. Uh, during the worst periods of the COVID, COVID situation. So asset monetization, disinvestment needs to be the fulcrum for this budget together with CapEx. Okay, Shogodo, don't, don't keep the mic there. Uh, I just want you to pick any song. That's your uh, personal favorite that will describe the economy and the budget making priorities. A tough one. I can, I can give you time. Yeah, Madan, you start. Okay. Uh, start. Uh, you start. Madan, and then I... No, actually in a lighter manner, I'll say Pink Floyd, we don't need no education. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I'll, if I come, I can't think of a song right now. Okay. Because it's such a complex situation. springs out automatically. But I'm trying to think uh, Aradhana or something, one, one of those songs. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe, maybe you, you, you'll help. Arathana always comes to mind when, when the... Sare jahan se achha Hindustan hamara. I think there couldn't be a better way to end this uh, panel. Thank you very much to our entire panel for uh, a great debate and to you in the audience for listening in patiently with that.